Um, and so the first thing that we wanted to start with uh, is this question that I just copied and pasted in. So mages is a word that represents marginalized genders. What gender identities would you consider to be mages? So we wanted to start by getting a sense of where everyone is at in terms of sort of content knowledge for the conversation before we move into some of these ideas around supporting youth um, in schools who might be LGBTQ or otherwise gender expansive. And since we're a pretty small group, you can probably unmute and respond, but if you aren't able to speak, you could also type into the chat. I'll be going in and out of mute because I have a two-year-old that's getting ready to go down for nap without mom, so I apologize. Um, but this is actually um, a new word for me, and I um, but somewhat confident in the poll, and now I'm not so confident. Um, so I'm really excited to learn more um, about this. And I'd say when it comes to gender identity, anything beyond male, female, I think would be considered, um, maybe considered part of this um, because they would be, they are marginalized genders. Females are too, um, but not to the extent in my opinion that LGBTQ um, and those um, with different genders are um, representing. Thank you, Ashley. Did anyone else want to want to give it a shot? Word for me also. Um, I would just kind of think it would be what we're here today for um, are black and. Latino and those type of groups. Don't know. I'm okay. so glad I'm here to find out. I appreciate I appreciate y'all for uh, for for giving for giving um, for giving a response. I will say uh, Mages was coined by um, a black woman because a lot of groups, a lot of organizations tend to do this thing where they'll have an event that's like women and non-binary and that really makes non-binary seem like either one a third gender or two like women light and that's not really what non-binary means at all so instead of doing that instead of marking um resources and organizations in that way people have um, come together and said well what about marginalized genders and mages marginalized genders represents anyone who's not a cisgender male so um, women are included as marginalized genders, non-binary people, gender fluid folks, gender queer folks. Uh, so, you know, it's a large and a wide range. Um, it's not necessarily the same exact um, experience, of course, but it gives a better categorization than not cis men, <laughs> which is not always helpful, and also does not do the weird thing of making non-binary a third gender when it is not. Um, it just, it's a catch-all for a lot of genders. Dakota, did you want to add to any of that or... Uh, no, but we can define cisgender. So thank you for that question, Tashira. So cisgender, um, cisgender people are those whose gender identity matches with their sex assigned at birth. Um, and so the example that is often given is um, in the delivery room, if a doctor says it's a girl and that person goes on in their life to identify as a girl or as a woman, then they would be cisgender. If the doctor says it's a boy and that person goes on to identify as a boy or as a man, then that would be a cisgender man. And then you have a number of folks who either identify as trans or non-binary or gender fluid, gender queer. There's a number of uh, alternative gender identities or expansive gender identities that people might align themselves with. Before we get uh, too deep into the conversation, now that we've done a little warm up. I was thinking, Coley, maybe you and I could introduce ourselves and then get some introductions from folks in the group before we have a conversation together. So, do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? Yes, please. Okay. So, uh, hi, everybody. I am Dakota Rotino Gorilli. My pronouns are she, her, hers, or they, them, theirs. Um, I am currently a school-based behavioral health therapist with Wesley Family Services. I'm actually at Perry Traditional Academy right now, the high school on the north side, which is where I do therapy with um, some of our students in the emotional support classroom. And um, I also am a member of the education working group of the Black Girls Equity Alliance at Gwen's Girls. Um, and just a 
bit of housekeeping for me, 215, which will be right as we're wrapping up, is when Perry dismisses. And so near the end of the session, I might have to keep going back on mute because we usually have end of day announcements and some bells ringing and the sounds of people transitioning in the hallway. So if you notice me going on mute near the end of the session, that will be why. And I'm happy to see everybody. Thank you, Dakota. My name is Coley Alston. Um, my pronouns are they, them, theirs, these, them, theirs. I am the program director at the Healing Wellness Foundation. You are currently in my messy office, so I'm sorry, but also that's so what we have. Um, like I said before, I was uh, a volunteer at Gwen's Girls back in 2013 to 2014 as a Schweitzer Fellow. Um, and I'm also the co-director of Trans Pride Pittsburgh. And um, is there anything else I wanted to add regarding that? Um, yeah, my background's in public health. So I'm um, really excited to be here and to be serving youth across a variety of intersections, uh, youth who are impacted by a variety of systems, um, but especially uh, queer Black youth. It's, you know, like that is my, um, my group that I'm most passionate about serving and supporting because they tend to be overlooked for a lot of reasons. And um, really excited to see you all here and that you are also passionate about making sure that all of our youth are being served and being supported. So thank you. Um, we have a group, it's relatively small, but just in the interest of time, maybe we could have folks introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, you could put your name, your pronouns, and the organization that you are with, or the reason that you're here for this talk today, whatever information you think um, would be helpful for us and for the other folks in the group. And then we will have um, a few discussion prompts that I can put into the chat to get us talking about supporting Black LGBTQ girls and gender expansive youth in schools. Awesome. I also threw that in the chat in case people were curious as to what to use to introduce themselves. So awesome. Thank you so much. Did we want to move on to the next Q&A question? Sure, yes. I'll put it into the chat. OK, and I will read it out loud if I can get to it. Ah. How does the school or site that you work in include or not include people of all genders, including folks who don't identify as male or female? So in a shorter way, what does inclusion look like for, you know, regarding gender at your organization or workplace? And you're welcome to unmute yourself and respond. Um, so I'll respond. We actually, um, I work with YWCA Greater Pittsburgh, um, and we run program um, in middle schools um, and kindergarten through eighth grade, but we run a program for girls in middle school. Um, we are um, trying to be as inclusive as humanly possible with this. Um, as an agency, our um, national org just um, delivered, and I don't even have the, the language yet, um, but we just delivered an, an update to our um, mission that includes more um, expansive when it comes to gender. So I'm really excited um, that we're moving in that direction as an agency um, and as an organization nationally. Thank you. Does anyone else wanna share what inclusion looks like at your workplace or your organization? Or what it doesn't look like, right? Like I, I think that some of us probably work at sites where we don't feel that people of all genders are being included as well. Uh, I'll share. Um, so I work at Beaver County CYS, but I'm on a, a leave right now for educational purposes. But um, recently there was a new employee and um, I believe she is transgender and it, nobody really talks about it. Like, I, I don't know. It's, I, I don't know. It's not really um, talked about. Not that I'm not saying it should be in a bad way, but I just felt like people, I don't know. I'm even me, you know, like I just started at Pitt and I, I had somebody in a group of mine that was gender queer. I'll be honest, I didn't really know what that meant. So I had, I like got this whole list of 
um, LGBTQ terminology so I could be a little bit more educated. Um, I referred to somebody in my group at like girl or something, hey girl, and they identify as gender queer and I would never intentionally offend somebody. So I felt horrible, but I'm from an old age. I'm 51 years old. I, I It's just all new to me, you know? So I feel like it, at my place of employment, that was the first time that there's been an employee that's, you know, hasn't fell into the norm. So I don't know. So Sue, it sounds like that you're uh, naming sort of a, a lack of a transparent conversation in a workplace culture. So right. um, I've been in spaces where, so I identify as, as trans, as non-binary, and I've been in spaces where it just is sort of unspoken. And to your point, you know, I don't need everyone at work to discuss my gender identity. However, right. I also would want to feel as though that would be a topic that would be welcome in the workplace or that that part of my identity would be visible and seen and respected, right? And so I think you bring up a good point that sometimes um, because folks aren't necessarily as informed or because organizations are careful not to create spaces that might come across as disrespectful, we sometimes wind up completely canceling out necessary conversations that would allow people to show up yeah. as their right. full selves. Yeah. Right. I mean, she's great. I mean, her name is Star, but I don't know if she, I don't know. I just talked to her. I think she's great, but um, I've just heard people like, is is she a girl? Is she a me? You know, and I don't know. How do you handle that? I, I'm, I've always been kind of upfront and real and personal, but also I'm learning. I don't want to offend anybody. So. Y'all, one of the things that I think, um, is it okay if I jump in? I'm sorry. I didn't know if someone had a response yeah. to Sue. Um, one of the things that I um, am thinking of as folks are talking is, it's a fear, a fear of getting it wrong that's very palpable. I don't work with young people any longer, but I am an organizational coach and I do policy work. And I think people are very afraid of getting it wrong, so they do nothing. Mm -hmm. I think that we don't use the language of ally or co-conspirator enough when talking about this work. And so I'm sure you're gonna to touch on it in your presentation or our talking points today. But for someone like Sue, the question is, okay, so what what can I do? What should I be doing? How do I hold right. space in an affirmative way? Yep. Right. I'm wondering if anyone in the group feels as though they found themselves in that position in the workplace in particular and how you may have operated as an ally or a co-conspirator for LGBTQ folks, whether they be coworkers or whether they be youth um, at your settings. I'll share this too. This is on a personal level. Um, you know, I do come from an older, I mean, I was born in 1969, so I do come from a very different era. And my youngest daughter, Ashley, came out to me probably about four or five years ago as gay. And I'll tell you what, it I've gone through a whole, I mean, this is really personal. I don't know what made me share this, but it, you know, it could be a very personal issue because I've seen how different, well, I shouldn't say organizations, but she's been a uh, hurt by the church and I just, oh, I, I've really come full circle and seen how people are um, marginalized and it, it just hurts my heart, especially for my daughter, but for everybody that is in that position because we people are who they are, you know? So you, you brought up something that I want to add to, but Meredith, I see that you have your hand raised. So do you have something you want to add? I do. I think, you know, to your, to your question about the workspace and whether you have an affirming workspace or whether you have, um, as Sue um, shared, a space where there's no literature or nothing, someone kind of comes into the space and you're unsure of, of what to do. As someone who works in Gwen's Girls, and I would have to say, if you don't work here, come work with us. This is one of the most 
open um, places I've ever worked in, just in terms of accepting, you know, we are an organization founded by African American women to help um, to help young girls. And in this space, we have white, we have black, we have Asian, we have women, we have LBGTQ plus, you know, I plus community. Um, I oversee the ASI virtual tutoring space. One of the things we do in our orientation before they fill out the HR paperwork, before they make a decision to accept our mission, we share that we're a very open place that is willing to grow and learn together. And that we do as a part of our requirement, um, we do SOGI training, sexual orientation, gender identity education. We talk about that we have people in this space that are free to use their pronouns or employees use their pronouns as a way to affirm, support, um, identify with their peers. And we're in the in a space where there's learning and there's acceptance. For those who know me on any given day, I'm probably the most politically incorrect person at the organization. Things just kind of fall out my mouth, right? And then we, you ask, you know, if you don't know, um, you ask when people, I'm also a very private person. So one of the things that came up in our SOGI training with some of the younger and older, I'm the same age as you, so I'm, I'm pushing 52 too. And one of the things that came up was when you have someone who comes into this space and, you know, no literature has been passed out or there, there hasn't been any SOGI training or that kind of deal, what do you do? And the simplest thing is to call that person by their name. Uh, you know, when you're building rapport with any new coworker or colleague, it's to simply, you know, hi, I'm Meredith, you know, and, you know, or maybe Dakota or Coley or Ashley or Noel will say, hi, I'm Noel or so. Some, one of the questions that came up is that should you inter, I, I introduce yourself by stating your pronouns? Um, that is a personal choice. I don't like people all in my business that way. I don't feel like the first time I meet somebody, I'm asking about pronouns or so is, hey, I'm Meredith, how are you? Would you, sometimes that's invasive. Uh, I feel like people will share what they want to share um, about themselves. And it's contingent upon us to just be kind of receptive um, and open. Something that I love about working with Gwen's Girls, especially in the, the house that I sit in, is uh, there's a lot of young college going folk, right? So that in and of itself to call them young and college going could be, could be offensive to some people. But they taught, they were like, Miss, you know, Miss Meredith, you don't use the H word. And when I was asking questions about cisgender, okay, explain this to me. How is it that you don't identify as either one and you're non-binary? One of my, you know, peers said, Miss Meredith, why does it matter? Because that's not about you. It's not about you. It's about the person. You don't have to ask a lot of invasive questions. I think it's amazing that we have these opportunities to learn from each other and take the initiative to educate ourselves and read up if we have. She said, the, wait, what's that word? H word, I had to ask to to shy right. It's from Aphrodite. I did not, I, I, I'm like, what is that? We were in a SOGI training with Tawanda and she, she asked a question and she said, well, we don't say things like the H word anymore. And I'm like, what is the H word? And you know, my mind is just going like, what is that? And she, you know, the, the term is now considered offensive. It's not something that we use in public spaces. Similarly, the way we don't call people mentally retarded anymore. I'm a special ed person. We say intellectually disabled or we say other things. And so I had never heard that. I hadn't heard it. I, I hadn't heard anybody talk about it. I also hadn't heard that word in about a decade, which makes me think, yeah, and it probably is inappropriate because nobody says it anymore. But in any case, I say all that to say that um, it, uh, thank you, Coley, intersex is the correct term. And, and again, though, those are what I, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even know that someone was intersex unless I had a relationship with the person or a rapport or some type of conversation beyond a surface level work conversation that that would come up because, you know, in my time and space, for me, it's not that I don't care, but that's just mixy in people's business. And I don't, you know, you don't, you wouldn't know, you can't tell by looking at someone you know, what their identity is or what it is they do. So it's like, you know, what are your professional skills? What are you, you know, what can you bring to the table so that we can get down? I think we lost Meredith. That was very abrupt.
Um, I did want to echo a few points though, too, especially like one piece is that pronouns are generally like, you know, your people are welcome to share them as they, as it, as they feel comfortable. But I will say too, again, that is still somewhere where people may not feel comfortable. There's a lot of reasons why people may not want to share their pronouns. Some of it could be privacy, but a lot of it could be fear of retaliation, fear of like, what is that? You know, so there's definitely um, a lot to think about there. But also I would say too, the idea, the rapport building is super important, especially when you're in a space, but we're talking even before then, if you can't even get your foot in the door, how are you gonna talk about building relationships? If I go into an environment and it's hostile from the jump, I'm not gonna wait around and build rapport and then share about myself if it's an unsafe place for me to be at. So there are both of those things to be considerate of. And um, yes, of course, you don't have to go into spaces and announce your gender, but we do it all the time. So that's the other thing too, we tend to not realize it, but people, um, share about their gender all the time, you know, they'll, um, you know, with a variety of uh, things regarding, you know, how they uh, style their faces, how they style their hair, how they, you know, present themselves physically, people are usually asking you like, hey, what do you think of my gender? And you might think that, oh, no, like, that's not what they meant. But a good example would be prom, you know, an event where people dress up in formal attire, they're showing you look at my gender, I'm performing gender so well. Do you see this? Are you appreciating it? Um, so even though we may not say the word gender, a lot of times we are you know, asking people to comment on it. We're asking people to participate and we're making assumptions about others. So that's just one area I did wanna make sure that we are being very clear about. Um, and, it's, and to Sue's point too, like you don't necessarily have to roll up on people and ask them like, hey, what is this? What does that mean? But as you get the opportunity, you know, like getting to know someone and building that rapport is important, but also you know, wanting to have a good first impression, wanting to have that door open so that if someone does wish to share with you, that they have the ability to do so. So um, there's a little bit of balance here. Yes. Yeah, something that I would add too is the reason that report building is so important is that LGBTQ identities or gender expansive identities like so many other identities aren't monolithic, right? And so my experience as a non-binary person might be different than the experience of another non-binary person. And the way that I, so I identify as non-binary, I also identify as a trans woman. That might sound confusing to some people because woman is a pretty binary option in our structure of gender in our society, but I consider my experience of womanhood to be outside of the gender binary or outside of the typical binary experience, which is why I still use both labels for myself. Um, and that's after years and years of self-reflection and you know coming to understand myself more. And so another person might not know that about me unless they took the time to really build a relationship and trusted space with me for me to feel comfortable sharing that. Um, and so I think to Sue's point from earlier and to Coley's point just now, gender expression is something that we're constantly assessing and that we're taught to assess in our society. So we look at a person and we say, okay, I'm going to base my presumption about their gender on how they wear their hair, what clothing they might be wearing, um, whether their voice is of a high or a low pitch, the shape of their body, um, whether or not I can notice that they have body hair, um, whether or not they are carrying or wearing certain accessories, the type of job that they have, the role that they might have in their household. And I use all of these things to make some assumptions about what their gender might be. And then I might be using different terminology to address them based on the assumption that I've made of what I perceive to be their visible gender. And so then I start projecting things onto them, right? Like I might say, well, as a woman, you must X, Y, and Z, or as a man, you must understand X, Y, and Z. And I might not know that person well enough to know whether or not that is actually how they identify. So I think it's important for us to also remember that even though we're talking about umbrella identities like LGBTQ, gender expansive, transgender, non-binary. There are lots and lots of folks who fit under those umbrellas and getting to know people individually and really building true, trusting, authentic relationships with them will be how we can learn from folks about their experiences. One more thing though, before we move on to the next question, I did wanna be very clear um, based um, identity versus treatment. Um, are two very different things. And it's something that in the United States is very difficult because historically, most people in the United States are categorized against their will. 
Um, so even, you know, for example, like the gender binary, people are assumed, you know, like you are assigned male or female, girl or boy. And if your identity, you know, varies from that, then people are like, we are going to force you into a box. And if you don't get in this box, we're not going to be nice about it. You know, similarly, you'll see other binaries like black or white. You know, if you talk to someone who's Latino and they're like, that doesn't even make any sense. Like, you know, like it, it, the answer might be both or like the answer might be indigenous and black or white. You know, when we get forced in these binaries and we project these binaries onto people, that's what spurs the poor treatment. It's not people identifying themselves for themselves. So I just want to be very clear about that. Um, just because I think it's super important. Oh, yeah, I'm going to put the next question into the chat. But I also want to say, since we're talking about youth, uh, and, and since we're in Pennsylvania, something that I want to note. So I'm a therapist, right? I work with young people, I work with people under the age of 18. Um, many of you probably know this, given the work that you do. But in Pennsylvania, 14 is the age of consent for treatment for services such as mental health. And so, for example, if I have a 14 through 18 year old young person in my emotional support classroom, any paperwork, any treatment plans, any of those things, releases of information, they have the agency to sign those things. Now, the reason I'm bringing that up is because when we talk about LGBTQ identities and there's like a kerfuffle about how, um, how old might a person be when they understand things about their gender or about their sexuality? So um, our best research says that between the ages of three and five are when most people start to recognize things about gender and society and about their own gender. So what that means is you might not have a three-year-old who says, I'm a trans girl, but you might have a three-year-old who notices that there are certain things that society says are for girls and they identify more closely with those things, right? And so they start to understand where they see themselves as fitting in to this broader system of gender as early as the ages of three to five. When it comes to sexuality and sexual orientation, we say that generally between the ages of 10 and 12 is when young people start to recognize um, their feelings in that arena. And that makes sense because that's around the age that young people are going into middle school, going through puberty, starting to develop different sorts of peer relationships, having crushes. And so those are all the types of experiences that might help a person to understand more about their sexual orientation. All of this is to say, a lot of folks might have a young person come to them and say, I identify as transgender, I identify as non-binary, I identify as LGBTQ. Um, and folks, get into a tizzy at times about whether or not we should or should not inform families. And I think it's important that we always remember to center young people's safety and agency. And so in Pittsburgh Public Schools, which I don't work directly for PPS, but I work at a PPS school, um, the policy is that if any young person, and this could be from the time that they're in pre-K all the way through the time that they graduate high school, if any young person comes out to an educator or staff member at Pittsburgh Public Schools, and says, but you cannot inform my family of this, it wouldn't be safe for me. That educator is not allowed to disclose that information to any biological or legal guardian, right? It's the young person's prerogative to determine who is allowed to have that information. That also means that a teacher or other staff member would have to say, can I speak to other teachers about this? Can I speak to the school social worker about this? Can I speak about this in front of your peers, right? So these are questions that we need to be asking um, before we, accidentally share more information than we should be about someone else's identity, both for personal confidentiality and respect reasons, but then also for safety as well. Um, I'm noticing that there is a lot happening in the chat too um, that I think is important for us to um, speak to. And yes, yeah, so Cole, your points are really well taken here. One of the things that we can think about in our spaces is when are these norms of gender, white supremacy, patriarchy, heteronormativity coming in in sort of um, covert or discrete ways because we take them as common sense, right? Because those are the ways that society has been structured and systems of power have been structured. So I think it's important that we always be asking questions um, of why do we do things this way or why do I think that or where is that assumption coming from um, when we interact with other people? Um, and I think that, Meredith, your point is also well taken. I think that often in conversations around families and caregivers, we find ourselves um, potentially putting a wedge between ourselves and families or adults who might not yet be accepting or understanding. And I think it's important that 
us as adults are able to have conversations with folks who might not yet be there along the path while creating affirming spaces for young people as well. Um, I think that a lot of family members and other adults sometimes don't feel invited into understanding these topics and they shouldn't be you know, practicing those conversations with young people who are at a vulnerable point in their development, but we do need to create spaces where people are able to have those conversations so that they feel more informed. Koli, do you have anything you want to add before we put the next questions in the chat? I just wanted to say too about the colonization piece and how colonization is really what enforced the binary across the across the globe is not the same everywhere. I mean, even within our, our current dominant societies within the United States, you know, there are very different pockets with cultures as far as um, you know, roles assigned to cer certain genders. So some uh, cultures would be like, okay, having long hair means this, or having short hair means that, or this is the person who provides for the family or this, you know, and it very much, it it is very much influenced by culture, but that hard, very fast line of this is okay and this is unacceptable, that is the binary that is very harmful because a lot of people do not fit in either this or that categories for anything. So, you know, at the end of the day, the binary hurts all of us, whether you're cisgender or transgender. So that's really just was my point around that. Thank you, Chloe. So we're gonna move from thinking about um, whether or not our sites are inclusive into thinking about actual tangible services for supporting young people. And so the questions that we just put into the chat are what service providers have you met that affirm black LGBTQ girls and gender expansive youth? Or what services are you seeking for black LGBTQ girls and gender expansive youth that you don't know a provider for? So this is a space where you all can feel free to uh, toss your two cents in as well. I'm gonna go on mute because I've been talking a lot. I wanna call out um, Flamingo Rampant. It's a publishing company. Um, and I actually pulled up their website that I will make sure I put in the chat, but um, they are producing feminist, racially diverse, LGBTQ positive children's books in an effort to bring visibility and positivity to the reading landscape of children everywhere. Um, I have a few of their books in my, um, in my child's library that are just, it's part of our rotation. I think school should have them in, in their rotation as well. Um, and it's a great resource for, for educators who are looking to, um, you know, include everybody in their classrooms. I have something to say about books, but I'm gonna be quiet in case someone else has another service provider or organization that they wanna highlight. And it doesn't have to be like all of the letters. I know like that can be very intimidating to see like LGBTQ plus, like if you know of a place that, you know, like, hey, you know, like I know of this resource and it's very supportive to black girls and non-binary black, black people, like that, that is something you're definitely welcome to share too. It doesn't have to encompass all of the, all of the letters, all of the range of gender and sexuality. Well, I think one of the problems that I would have, I mean, again, I'm in the DC Metro is when I think about organizations here that specifically serve young trans and queer youth, they're not doing the work from a culturally responsive lens as well, right? So I remember being in law school and reading this article uh, that was entitled Gay Rights for Gay Whites, and it was all about how white cisgender gay men had basically co-opted the LGBTQ movement and made it all about marriage. And I think so often about what the parallels are to that in our service provision, right? We still tend to have this very myopic lens around what it means to serve LGBTQ young people, despite the fact that we know they sit at multiple intersections. So I might be able to name an organization for Black girls, or maybe for gender expansive youth, or for LGBTQ youth, but I can't name an organization that's really doing the work to serve young folks who sit at all of those intersections, unfortunately. Okay. It's going to be Gwen's girls. I say here, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> you got some work to do, Coley and Dakota. You got some work to do. <laughs> I would very much love for that to be Gwen's girls, really. Um, <laughs> Honestly, and because there are a few pockets and to, uh, to share as a point, like, yeah, I do find that's very common when I, I, I work with you directly. So, um, but one of the biggest things that, um, and reasons why I left previous organizations is because like you said, they're very siloed in that 
I worked for a predominantly black organization that was like, okay, yeah, but don't bring up any of that LGBTQ stuff. We're not going to do any of that. And I'm like, okay, this is not a good fit. I went to a, a predominantly LGBTQ organization. I'm like, yeah, LGBTQ. Why are there so many black children here? They're, they're just, they're just so loud. They're just so many of them. So I'm like, okay, this is not going to be a good fit here. I can't. So I'm like, so that's why I'm really glad to be in this space that I'm at at Hugh Lane, where I'm able to do that and able to be very mindful of that. And also even our um, center of excellence does cover that as far as we do SOGI, but we do SOGI with a culturally um, mindful lens, you know, especially because we know that we know that in, even within the LGBTQ communities with an S, it's plural, they don't necessarily always overlap. They're not a monolith. So that's something super important to, to know about and to be mindful of. And I will say, especially in Pittsburgh, when I talk to young people, they usually tell me something to that effect where I can go here and it's cool and I can do fun, you know, like, like, you know, just Black cultural things and have a good time. But as soon as I bring up the fact that I'm queer or trans, then everyone's like, don't bring that around here. Or I can go to an LGBTQ place, but there's so many racial microaggressions are just like, I'm exhausted, Coley. Like, I just don't want to do that. So I'm very much like, yes, I, I echo that. That is a lot of the truth that, um, that I've been noticing and spaces that we're trying to carve out in Pittsburgh in particular. I did want to give a quick shout out to, um, uh, Dreams of Hope. It's a queer youth arts program. Um, we're going to share it with a resource list later. Um, but, but especially uh, Becca Zela um, is one of the leaders at Dreams of Hope, also runs the Black Unicorn Library. And I love all of her selections are very much with um, Black women in mind, and especially Black women at multiple intersections regarding gender, regarding sexuality. And um, so just, you know, a local, local treasure. But also just to uh, toot my own horn really quickly, I do have a uh, queer book club that I run through Hugh Lane Wellness Foundation. And I was just really excited because our book for next month for the month of October is, it's a fiction book, The Mermaid, The Witch and the Sea. And you're just like, okay, cool, whatever, cool. It's a young adult book. The main character is a black gender fluid young person. So I'm so excited for this, a gender fluid pirate. And um, they are assigned female at birth. Flora, but on the pirate ship, they go by Florian because it's a pirate ship and it will be very, very dangerous for a girl child to be wandering around there. So there's a lot of complexity in this book, but also it's still fun because this is, you know, this is fan fantasy fiction and it's just a beautiful way to share and to have people say like, I saw myself in this book or like, wow, I didn't realize, you know, they have a, um, what's in this book? There is a sea deity, like, you know, basically like like a demigod, but the, the basically that transcends gender. So it's like you have a non-binary deity and it's not a big thing. Like it's just stuff that I pulled out of this book, but to see that and to have that and just being so normalized, just throwing up on the bookshelf, that is something really cool. And then just another shameless plug. Um, uh, Sonia Renee Taylor is actually from Pittsburgh. So if you're familiar with the body, your body is not an apology. She wrote this book. This is the workbook for that, um, for that, um, for that uh, workbook. Uh, but I did want to say, you know, she's local, she's from Pittsburgh, um, is queer, is Black, very visible, and um, just thinking about that too, as far as how do we highlight the, the treasures and the gems that we currently have in Pittsburgh and elevate those too. Um, but yeah, does anyone have any other organizations or, you know, programs, projects that they wanted to give a shout out to? Or, and if they don't have a, particularly a shout out, are there any programs or organizations that you would love to adapt to become a little bit more welcoming and inclusive? The the fact that every oh, I was just going to say yeah. the 412 um, Youth Zone in Pittsburgh, they have um, an LGBTQ support group upstairs. I'm not sure what the room is called, but they're really supportive and they provide protection for um, youth and screening and um, any re resources that they need help with. Um, they try to help them the best they can. So that's a really good program. And also there is another one. I'm sorry, I just contacted them today. And it is called, let me see, it is called Foster Love Project. And um, I recently got a youth who was, um, who's non, who is non-binary. And this is my first time working with a, um, LGBTQ youth. Um, my mother is LGBTQ, so I'm familiar and I'm very supportive. And um, this Foster Love, they're really supportive with um, this, the youth that I have, she, um, they recently, needed clothes and um one problem that we had at Gwen's Girls was I looked in our closet and I realized that we only had um feminine clothes 
So this weekend I'm going there and they're giving me a whole bunch of different clothing um, for our youth who are non-binary or dressed differently. So that's something that um, they help out with and it's called Foster Love. Awesome. That's wonderful to hear that Foster Love is doing that work. Um, I, I've seen stuff for the little, little kids, so I've had my eye on them, but it's wonderful to see uh, the work that they're doing with preteens and teens. Also, another shameless plug, I also have free binders for youth, so if you know someone under the age of 21 who needs uh, binders um, you know, to flatten the appearance of, of their chest, I have those, and they're free and brand new for youth, so just throwing that out there, too. I'm also really happy to hear that 412 Youth Zone is still doing that support group because I used to work with them. So it's good to know they're still doing that. Yes. Thank you, Noah. Well, I think the fact that everybody is not like flooding the chat with different organizations that support you speaks volumes for the work that needs to be done to um, have more organizations that are doing the work. You know, my heart is near and dear to little people. So when we talk about 14 being the age of consent, but we start talking about identity and how kids see themselves or know that it's not the way mom and dad see them um, is different. It's critical. Like how do, how do you support, you know, a caregiver and how do you support a teacher or, you know, and you guys are referencing literature and, you know, we know large public school systems or suburban school districts, it's, it's unique in every school district, right? But we know, you know, globally that it's gonna go with what traditionally is viewed our, as traditional gender roles. And what are, you know, I think about ways that we can get more information out there to help teachers, to educate them, even in their language. So if I'm a childcare provider in a daycare center or kindergarten, and I think kindergarten, first, second grade, still have, um, they call them make-believe or career exploration or the PlayStation where you dress up creative dress and play and so that we don't say okay well Dakota that put that down because that's for a boy or the pink is for girls and the blue is for boys or the language you use by saying you know you call everybody when you teach pronouns you teach the pronouns that you know well what what pronouns are we comfortable with which ones do which ones do we want to use which ones do you like when we're in that space and then really having those conversations with administrators and parents you know, about how you're trying to make this space neutral and affirming where kids can explore, where the boys can put on the pink Timberlands and the apron, just as well as the girls can put on the hard hat and do whatever, and how we differ our language. We will often say, we do it, I'm, I'm probably going to be guilty of it before the sun sets today. I will see a little girl and say, oh my goodness, look how pretty you are, you're dressed or so, or you know, or say to, or, and I, we're not that way about boys or so. We don't talk about boys in their dress and things of that nature, but we'll see a little girl, we'll see a girl and we'll automatically call attention to her dress. Oh, look at your pink and look at your bow. And we're a boy, it's, oh, you're a boy, you need to stop crying or boys don't do this or boys don't do that. How we do, how we change our language and how we interact with kids. You know, we will often divide kids up in the teams. All right, I need the boys on this side and the girls on this side, or the girls are wearing pink and the boys will have blue. Choose orange, choose green, choose turquoise. Let kids choose the colors that they want. The materials that we have in the rooms, often we just all, we had usually just have baby dolls and they're usually girl baby dolls. Like you can choose different things for kids to play with or to explore and the representation around the room, just not, you know, ethnically, religiously, you know, kids with disabilities or not, just creating that space where we respect diversity and the uniqueness and individuality of all kids at a really early age and educating ourselves because, you know, I have sat in the seat of being a third grade teacher who had a, a young man that came to school, he wanted to carry a black beaded purse and a red sequence belt and colored lip gloss. And this was in like the 90s, so that was not flying. It was, there was a lot of fights on the playground, a lot of tears. And I, and his, you know, the family was very much, this is who he is. And I had to say, I have 34 kids in this classroom. I can't keep him safe because the fighting on the playground and when he leaves my classroom, the bullying was so pervasive. And we had to, you know, we had a lot of meetings with the kids, but we also, I had to, you know, he did, he had to be suppressed, but I had to compromise with, with, with his family and say, okay, you know, we seem, you know, one of the targets is that he carries the purse. 
can we can we choose a different person or can we choose something different but i'm i'm still making him change who he is because i'm in the panic situation of him not being safe and not knowing what to do and all the, you know teachers weren't supportive of it don't let him go out and play so he's supposed to sit in this classroom for the next three years in this school and never go to recess because we can't figure it out you know or talking to grandma I'm just about like I understand what you're saying but can we compromise can he wear the clothes on the weekend I'm okay with the lip gloss but does it have to be purple today or you gotta give me something in between we can do the the nail and at that time we weren't having conversations kids were you know making really unkind remarks and using terms that we don't use anymore and you know they weren't getting suspended or getting called to the office for that type of behavior and then now we have things like woke read aloud and the literature and books and things that are affirming and educating that you can add to your classroom library but at the same time as a teacher in a public space or organization the conversations really still have to be had at the administrative level because all of those books won't be welcome or a part of a classroom library or purchased school-wide to be used in schools and all parents won't be supportive of that and we see what's going on now like some school districts have adopted gender neutral bathrooms and other schools have not and a lot of what happens with that is at 14 and above but there's so much going on k to five where most of the damage is being done right there because they don't have a voice. They don't have the language to express what's going on with them. Teachers aren't educated or supported in how to create the affirming spaces. Parents are still wrestling. They're only four. They don't know what they are. That kind of, you know, or they're only five, that kind of language, you're kind of, you're, you're kind of stuck in the conundrum. So it'll be interesting to see as, you know, the years go on, what happens but that k through five pre-k through five population that's under 14 is struggling is struggling i think that's why you see so much of the suicide and depression and because the damage is done you know i've been oppressed pre-k to till the time i get 14 where someone is helping me and even then we're saying in this group that it's not enough it's still not enough i know coley you wanted to jump in yeah, I was just going to say there's a lot there, like Meredith, you've said a lot of things, um, but also I did want to um, respond to a few pieces, especially like there's this idea too that um, young people tell us who they are. When they feel comfortable with us, they tell us who they are. And we as adults, we react, whether our reaction is saying nothing, whether we're affirmative, um, whether we're dismissive. Like, so there's definitely like that. But a lot of times when young people tell us who they are, we say, oh, you're too young to know who you are. You're too young. You don't even know what you're talking about. And when they're older and they try to tell you, this is who I am. Oh, well, if you knew that, you would have told us earlier. So it's just this like catch 22 of like, you just don't believe when young people tell you who they are repeatedly. Also um, with the suppression piece, uh, that, that story is breaking my heart. I'm thinking about it. But I also think too, how many parallels there are with cisgender black girls who are treated the same way. Oh, your beads make too much noise. So we're gonna have to cut your little braids off. You know, oh, you're to this, you're to that, you're visible. So it's not even just a matter of how a child operates and how they identify. It's the fact that other people don't want them to exist, period. No matter how you suppress a child and their looks and their appearance or anything like that, really what adults are saying at the end of the day is I don't want you to exist. How can I erase you in some way, shape or form? And that's actually why we have so many young people now who are in that 14 plus range who are saying, this is who I am, this is what I need. And we see them now and we think it's an explosion of young people, but really it's the fact that they are living to that age. Like you were saying with the suicidality piece, Suicide prevention, you know, it, it, it runs the gamut of things, but one of the biggest and strongest ways to affirm someone and, and, and work for, towards suicide prevention is using their name, using their pronouns. If you use a child's correct name and pronouns, it drops their rate of attempting suicide by 40%. So like there, even though I know, again, we're not fixing everything, but even the small steps that we are taking, that we are making are what's saving children's lives. Because the reason why I'm in this work is really because I want kids to make it to adulthood. Right now, we have so many kids that feel so abandoned by, in their homes and their communities and their schools, places where they should be safe. And they feel like they have literally no one and there's no future to look forward to. So even if we can't make it perfect, which I know we can't, um, we know uh, there's a variety of other systems too that are impeding these children's lives. I'm not saying we can correct that all 
all one go. But we as individuals, we as caring adults, we definitely have a power to help a child and to create some protective factors in their lives. So that is like my initial response. But thank you so much, Dakota. Do you have something to say? Yeah, so I wanted to, um, in response to to Shara's question, I have a question that I'm going to put into the chat um, for the group. But one of the things that I was thinking about in terms of Meredith's story was this idea of um, kind of like two things. So the way that we tend to deal with these issues in the realm of punishment and the way that uh, we don't tend to deal with these issues in terms of youth empowerment. So one of the biggest types of policies that we see for supporting LGBTQ or gender expansive young people is anti-bullying policy. And the unfortunate reality is that we probably need to have anti-bullying policies in schools because we know that bullying takes place and there needs to be consequences for bullying. We need to have systems by which we promote pro-social interaction among young people for sure. But we also see that anti-bullying policy tends to be punitive. It tends to impact certain youth more than others. So we see that um, often black cisgender youth are hyper visible inside of school systems um, and are out in different ways than white cisgender youth might be for transphobia and homophobia. And we also see sometimes that young queer people who use certain terminology either to identify themselves or disparagingly toward other young queer people are being caught up in anti-bullying policy. So I as an LGBTQ young person who's working through my identity might be considered a bully to other LGBTQ young people under the policy. And now I'm being punished rather than being supported. And so I think that when we limit our um, understanding of these issues to those sorts of policies, we lose out on a ton of conversations that we could have with young people. And so if we were using things like literature, um, current event discussions, et cetera, um, to create empowered conversations among young people, we could start to break down some of these norms that young people are coming to school with. Like I have um, an emotional support classroom of five students right now. I have two students who identify as LGBTQ. And yesterday, um, a cisgender boy in our classroom used the F slur. And um, one of the girls in our classroom who identifies as bisexual was very offended by that. And we wound up having a conversation about how sometimes we're taught as people that certain words are okay to say. And until we come into a different space or come across a person of another experience, we might not understand that we've been taught incorrectly that a word is okay or that it doesn't have a harmful meaning, right? And so I am certainly not saying that my queer students should be subjected to hearing disparaging slurs in the classroom, but also we have an opportunity to have a conversation with all of those students together about how can we use more inclusive and empowering language. If I were only relying on my anti-bullying policy, I would send that young boy out of the room. He might be in, in school suspension. He might be sent out of the building. And then we're not working on building those relationships and restoring the harm that happened in that space. And so I think that it's important for us to think about how are we um, empowering young people or building their leadership capacity as well. Um, to share, I saw that your hand, hand is up. Oh, just very quickly in that example that you just gave Dakota, it made me think about the book that Coley mentioned um, that they are reading in their book club and how I think sometimes we feel like we have to have all the language correctly. We have to have the LGBTQIA gender expansive youth and we got to have the Bible of terms. Um, and there's nothing wrong with obviously like doing our work to understand marginalized identities better. Sometimes it's just reading a book. Sometimes it is bringing in a visibility and representation that was not there before. So I just want to say that really quickly. And we're at a time too, where I mean, like we could talk about Lil Nas X's new album. We could talk about, um, you know, representation at different award shows. We could talk about Bowie Porter, we're in Pittsburgh. We could talk about Pose. We could talk about any number of pieces of media that um, young people are very aware of and that they're following. We could talk about YouTubers. Um, a lot of it for those of us who are 30 and above is like extra work that we might not know about, right? Like I don't watch a ton of YouTube videos. Um, I was born in 1990 and I know that we have folks in the room who are older than me too, who might not watch a ton of YouTube videos. Look at me um, enacting some ageism in this space. So you might be watching more YouTube than I do. Um, but in any case, there are some things that we kind of have to brush ourselves up on in order to communicate with our young people. And we can just ask them too and allow them to bring in examples of things that they find 
to be interesting and um, culturally responsive to them so that we're having relevant discussions um, that create the space for the topics that are already important to their day-to-day -day lives. I know that we only have a couple minutes left, so I'm gonna put in a link in the chat to our um, Legendary is an amazing show. Um, a link in the chat to our resource guide. This should allow all of you to view it as a Google Doc. Um, but in our last moment, is there anything that anyone wanted to share? I just want to say thank you. Um, this was very informative. I work primarily with middle school students. Um, and I'm just, I was coming to this uh, chat or this discussion to make sure that I was doing the right thing um, and that we're doing the right thing here at the Children's Museum. So thank you guys so much. I also joined this chat for more information. So I just wanna say thank you also. I work with the STARS program for Gwen's Girls. So I work with um, trying to deter youth from the juvenile justice system and the foster care system. And we have a lot of um, LGBTQ youth. So this was very informative, informative and helpful. Thank you. Thank everyone. I think Dakota, I'll see you shortly because I, will you be at the BGA? subgroups yeah subcommittee i i maybe we're about to transition out of the building and i have after school duty to go watch the buses uh, the I that's a passive no <laughs> or you're gonna try we'll see you you say a passive no versus an aggressive i, think, I don't know i think it was an active maybe oh, i'm active. not sure <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. This was this was nice. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Have a great day. Bye. -bye. There's so I mean, there's so many things that could come up here. I need K five on the I need K five on deck. There's so many things. I did a presentation this morning. I worked with um some. I work with tutors and people who are getting ready to go into the school. <laughs> And we had this whole conversation about the literature for little ones in kindergarten and what's okay. And there's some, some really good books out about gender identity or so kindergarten. And to have to say to, you know, to say to a novice teacher, someone who's aspiring to be a teacher, you need to get that book cleared with your administrator first, because you don't want to lose your job before you have one. And there's, you know, half the room is saying, it doesn't matter, she's gotta be woke and be in there because they have a right to know none of us are gonna pay her bills. It's the culture or the building. Like there's some, some battles that need to be fought first. She has to be smart, you know, think about that. This book is amazing in my opinion, but that's that opinion isn't widely held and that's part of the problem, but you know, Meredith about under what policy would it be considered like a breach of what is allowed in schools because it's a form of children's literature so you can't so I, the issue is is that so the library collections in most public schools one they've been there since time immemorial so you'll find books in there from 1822 in some of those libraries <laughs> but generally there is someone who selects the books that are purchased for schools or the librarian will select those books and they're usually from some type of approved list or just general scholastic type books but for the most part it, it would only to read something like that in school although um, gender identity orientation there are pieces different types of family and diversity is in the curriculum it is in the curriculum in some places especially in the library for the younger kids but to read something that would bring back parental um, backlash or deals with um, issues um, about gender identity in a kindergarten class, you haven't sent permission slips home for families, that hasn't been approved by your, by your principal, that would bring you, you your, the door would be closed on you before you even got in the door. And like as a novice teacher, or she's a student teacher, you know, it was like, you need to, you know, clear that. Have you shown that book to your cooperating teacher? Is that a part of the curriculum? You may think that this is amazing, but you really have to think about the situation in which you're presenting that information. You know, and, and so. I, I, sorry, I think that brings up the importance of co-conspiratorship in that space too. I remember, so I, I'm an ELA certified teacher. Um, not that I use that license right now, but uh, when I was student teaching, 
I had um, a co-op teacher who was very progressive. And so I was, I had the space where I was to be able to do some things that some other people weren't afforded the, the privilege of being able to do. And we always had it planned so that if someone came into my room and said, oh, where in the curriculum is this text that you're teaching? I would say, oh my gosh, I'm a student teacher. I'm so sorry. I had no idea, right. <laughs> you know, like kind of play, play the system that way. Um, but I think it's important to find who are the other people in my space. Hopefully there's at least one that I can rely upon to go to bat for me when I'm in more of a vulnerable position, um, whether that's a tenured teacher, whether that's an administrator, whether it's a district reading coach or whoever that might be, um, who we can leverage some of that uh, institutional power to be able to get young people the resources that they need. Well, and it was dealing with her with just some basics. Like, as you say, um, the cooperating teacher is supposed to review that lesson plan in the book, right? She hadn't even shown it to her. And so, I'm saying, you know, one, follow your protocol because the teacher will let her know if she's in that type of space that, oh, this is fine. We do this all the time. This is in the curriculum. This will go. Someone's supposed to be guiding her in her pedagogy, right? Pedagogy and content first as a practic practitioner. And then she could deal with the other issues. But I'm like, just follow, follow the protocol. Do give it to your student, your a cooperating teacher, see where they are. But she was like, well, everybody, look. And that's, the, that's the, the balance, right? Is that even as a teacher, when you have little people in your place, sometimes we overstep our boundaries as teachers. You know, we recognize that people have different parenting styles, different religions, different cultures. We don't have a right to impose. We have to be, have to think neutrally, have to really think globally. There are a lot of things that I believe I'm an extremely conservative person. Uh, when I'm, I'm a very conservative person, I